This is Broad Radio. For you, by you. Broad Radio. Here for more. Hello and welcome to Broad Radio. I'm Jo Stanley and I'm thrilled as always to welcome co-host Miff Warhurst. Hi Miff. Hello Jo, so good to be here. Look at the two of us I resplendent know. in matching red jumpers. I know, I felt like I was going for the, the Broad Radio colour palette. I didn't realise you would be too. <laughs> and I love it, I think it's perfect. I love it too, my daughter this morning because I'm wearing a red jumper and a black pair of jeans and runners. And I said to my daughter, who's 13, and my go-to on all things style and fashion. Yeah. I said, am I norm core or mum core? <laughs> and what and was the answer? She said, you're sad core. Oh, no. <laughs> Brutal. Brutal. How good are teenagers? I just love it. They just cut you down in a second in the best possible way. Well, look, I didn't have to ask, but I actually do trust her opinion. Yeah. She's so naturally stylish because unlike us when we were teenagers, they have the internet, yeah. they have TikTok, they have YouTube, they have so much influence and they just get it right somehow. Yeah, look, I think that comes with the, the negative side as well. There's almost too much to choose from. I wouldn't cope at all. I'd be so distracted by everything. I wouldn't. I still wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. And I think that's the case for my life now. <laughs> but yes, it would have been amazing to be able to have access all that information about what people are wearing overseas or yeah. you know, in all parts of the world. And that's the beauty of it. Or even like makeup, right? So oh, she no. comes out with fully applied, beautiful makeup. I'm like, you know what? You're missing the rite of passage of badly applied makeup that we had as teenagers. <laughs> Bit of with coal the, eyeliner under the, yeah. under the li- too much under the lid. And the line, you know, how oh, we yes. had that orange line around the jaw. Because we didn't know to blend. We, we didn't know. Anything. <laughs> we did not know anything. And also... You know, there was everyone had one perfume. Everyone mm. went to one shop pretty much. Yep. It was like Sports Girl or Cherry Lane. And, <laughs> oh, Cherry Lane! <laughs> oh my God, I loved Cherry Lane. I lived to have anything from Cherry Lane, and I wasn't. You know the Cherry Lane Grandpa top yeah, that we all had. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, you have given me so many feels, Miff. I can't tell you. It was the thing I I, I coveted so much. I had to go to Adelaide. I lived in a near Mildura in uh, top of Victoria, but I had to go to Adelaide, which was five hours away, my closest capital city, to go to a Cherry Lane store. So, um, you know, it was a very big deal back in those days. And I also got myself a a special city haircut too, I remember, which was uh, an early iteration of the mullet. Um, Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that was terrible. Was um, it? I, I got it done in Adelaide and I thought I was being high fashion and I had no idea how bad it was going to look on me. This is like 1985 or something. How did it go in Mildura or clo- or the, the, the surrounds of Mildura when you got back? Oh, I think I, I thought I was top of the pile fashion-wise, but um, yeah, I don't think so. I think I looked ridiculous. But anyway, that's rite of passage. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Well, today we have a beautiful show ahead for us. We have two incredible women who I believe... Oh, you know, we've loved them for so long on our screens and in our ears. Uh, We've got rock royalty with Ella Hooper joining us. And then after that, Dr. Katrina Warren, who's going to tell us, is it okay for my dog to be the ruler of the house? That's Mm. what I need to know. (laughs) My answer is yes immediately, but I know that that's wrong. 
I don't know. Humans are weird with their pets, aren't they? Oh. So we're looking forward to uh, Katrina Warren joining us as well. Um, but to start the show, Miff, I, I have to say I always hesitate to start a conversation at the right at the beginning of a show in something that's really um, very distressing. Mm. But I can't ignore this because I keep watching videos and reading about hashtag keep talking about Iran. And so I thought, well, I need to actually keep talking about Iran. And of course, we are seeing this terrible situation in Iran where um, the violence on the streets is escalating. And it all occurred because of this very, very sad death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, who had been arrested by morality police for wearing her hijab too loosely. And three days later, after being in, um, in prison, essentially, she died. And I just... You know, the fact is that now there's protests on the street and over the last three or four days, they've shut down the internet in Iran, which is incredibly disturbing. And that's why they're saying, please keep talking about Iran, because they have a history of uh, torture and executions in Iran. And we just don't know what's happening there now for them. No, no. And probably the only way to get the message out is the internet. And a lot of people... um, criticise social media but quite often it is a way to keep this sort of thing in the world's consciousness like it's otherwise it it would be completely closed off and we would never know we would never know but what about the courage of the women who are leading these protests and who are cutting their hair publicly and doing these incredible things where you just think they're basically doing that understanding that they may die for that Yeah, for their own, you know, just to say that it stops now. I I won't allow this to happen. Um, so I will do whatever it takes and at whatever cost that is. Yeah, I can't imagine how terrifying that would be, and mm. I can't imagine what they would face on a daily basis. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 almost unfathomable from the luxury of our our safe places here. It, it's true, and it, it, you know, you always feel like, ah, uh, what even can we do? Well, we keep talking about Iran um, and I guess you, through social media, can put pressure on governments, our own government, to do something about it Um, and just hopefully the women on the other side of the world know that they're not forgotten somehow. Yeah. It's a horrible feeling. It is a horrible feeling Um, and, yeah, like I said, unfathomable from, from here in Australia, a very safe place and I think it's a real reminder of how lucky we are here and, yeah... Um, and what a privilege it is to have been born here yeah. in, in that sense. Yeah. And, and our, you know, if we can, to share it. Yeah. And I'm getting uh, some lovely women joining us on the show today um, who are also joining us in saying such brave women in Iran, those women are brave and courageous and they've been pushed past their limits. Wow, it's true. Whatever it takes, we are with them in solidarity. Thanks so much, Eche, for that comment. You can share your comments and your uh, questions along the way on the show today if you're joining us live, Facebook and YouTube. And you can catch up on any of our previous episodes or listen to this one again if you love it so much um, on our podcast, Broad Radio On The Go, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I will say, and I don't say this flippantly, thank God for music, Miff. Oh, I know. I know. Well, I wouldn't have a book that I've, I'm about to release. <laughs> um, it's true. Because I've, I've, I've got a book coming out, my, you my do, debut. Darling. I guess it's a memoir, but it's more snapshots from my life, not necessarily a complete memoir. Um, but it's inspired by the music I was listening to at the time that the stories happened. So mm. it's it's almost like a, a you know, it's, it's the music that, I guess, um, how do I explain a it? A soundtrack to your it's life? It's a soundtrack, but it, it's it's almost like the music comes with the memory. Yes. In, in that it's not necessarily even about the music. It's it's what was there, but it's every memory I realised is tied into some sort of song or a couple of songs or a couple of musical moments. Pretty much every memory of mine. I'm not sure why. It's probably like other people have food mm. memories or smell memories. Um, mine's music. As you, soon as I hear a song, I'm like straight back there. Well, I mean, I would have to say I can't separate you from music. That's how we sort of first fell in love with you as, <laughs> as a journo. Um, and certainly I think, um, you know, we all have a soundtrack to our life, I guess. Yeah, but we do. Um, you, your knowledge of music is really, I love it. It's something that I learn from you. Um, but it is that thing where you go, um, music is both... Uh, soundtrack but it's a comfort I think I think it's a thing that makes you go um, well life is sometimes really hard but 
oh my god, I'm going to put this song on, mm. whether it's Adele or yeah, I'll <laughs> have a good cry or I'll have a good dance or I'll do whatever I need to do to it with it, yes. whatever. And it can really, it's it's good for the soul. It's true. So uh, I'm very warmed. We are very warmed to, to invite our first guest to join us. There she is. She's uh, been a part of our lives for decades now. I call her rock royalty, Ella Hooper. Hi there. <laughs> Where's my crown? Where's <laughs> your crown, Hello, darling? Thanks, lovely legends. Yeah, I mean, our music is hands down the best therapy for me too and the cheapest. Yeah. <laughs> What's your go-to for comfort music? Oh, I have playlists and playlists of the stuff. And, I, I mean, it's no joke. I don't think I would have coped with the last few years without certain songs that I can listen to up to, you know, 20 times a day. Honestly, if I'm in a certain headspace and I need soothing, I put on a certain playlist that's got all sorts of weird stuff. Some of it you would never have heard of. My guilty pleasures are very random. And some of it, you know, is incredibly mainstream. But it's whatever sort of sparks that calm or comfort and it just works like magic on me you know and I use it relentlessly just I, I hope everyone does that as well right it's just such an amazing go-to that's in your pocket these days on your bloody iPhone is the ticket to feeling completely different or self-soothing or getting g'd up or losing the nerves I mean what can't it do yeah do you do you are you aware that you are that for other people like when you're making music like that's kind of beautiful but also yeah. freaky to imagine that you're someone's therapy. That still blows me out. Like to, to switch, you know, to flick the switch and put the shoe on the other foot. No, I can't quite believe that because, of course, I don't listen to my own music like that. That will give me a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that's not right, you know, but it's such an honour and I do get those messages and especially with some of the new stuff, the new music I've been releasing, I've only got two new tracks out. It's a day of new releases, Miff. It's like, oh, oh yeah. so exciting. But, yeah, when those messages come in, I just feel blown away that, that, that I might be providing that for someone else, yeah. You provide it for other people and you get it from other people's music, but in terms of your own songwriting, is that a kind of therapy for you too, the, create, the creativity? Oh, so much so. The, that's my favourite part of the whole crazy gig of being a musician or being a performer, entertainer, you know, I'm a little bit of all of those things. But it's really the songwriting where I can um, work through something in that format. It's always fascinated me. And now that I do that for a living, it's just, yeah, again, it's like, it's quite magic. I think a lot of songwriters try to explain what makes a song moving or what makes it connect more than song A to song B. Sometimes you don't bloody know. You think you've done your best work, your most, you know, highfalutin songwriting job on song song A, but it's song B that really cuts through and everyone goes crazy about and cries too. And you're like, wow, you just, you don't know sometimes. And I, But I think it might come down to how much of, your raw emotion got through the songwriting process. If a lot of it comes through, then you're probably on a good wicket. Mm. So, th so that implies, though, that you at times have to make a decision, and as a writer too, how much of yourself you'll share. And if you're at a crossroads in writing a song, do you? <laughs> she's like, oh, do you protect <laughs> yourself? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. There's heaps of songs of mine that have hit the, the scrap heap because I'm just too shy to put them out. You know, if it's just so obvious who it's about and what the incident that inspired it may have been, I, I get cold feet and sometimes wait for one that's a little bit more cloaked in metaphor or that can be less specific but just as effective. Although... I've been told by my songwriting gurus, the more specific you are, the more personal you are, mm. somehow the more universal. So I'm trying yes. to challenge myself on that yeah. right now. You know, I'm trying to really front up and be like, just put it all out there. Even though you think it might be too specific to write about some conversation that your parents had driving down a back lane in Violet Town. You know, but Paul Kelly does that. He's yes. just, you know. Oh. When I look at the groups, they are pretty... They don't hold back and they, they share a lot of what you might imagine might have really happened. But mm. then there's the whole other layer. Did it happen or was that just genius songwriting? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. Don't, 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 don't prick my bubble. I believe it all happened. Yeah. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, keep believing. Keep believing. 
how do you get the confidence though to put it all out there? I mean, I think as uh, particularly as women, we've we've self edited in so many ways oh. in terms of how we appear and how we are perceived, and 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 then when you put something down in song, and you're challenging yourself to not self edit in that way because you know that the opposite actually works better. It's still tough, isn't it, to be truly I, open and to really truly show yourself. It's so tough. It's so so tough. And if I reckon you said the magic word, it's like. And as you get older, you know, like I'm I'm nearly forty now, but self editing is something that you start to recognize more and more and more as you fill out as a person and and you know you want to be more and more authentic and powerful and step into your power and you realize just how much we self edit so often whether it's just at the shops um or you know in a you know a personal situation or a retail situation but i think that's why people go so crazy for musicians and you know in my experience for for rock chicks for example is that's a really powerful role when a woman takes you know at the the front job in a rock band and becomes that sort of strong energetic force that rock bands that propels rock bands people go so crazy for that because I think it's such a rare and occasional thing to see a woman doing to just like lose their lose their inhibitions and don't worry if you're gonna you know look like an idiot or a fool or a clown because that's actually a really important part of being a good rock and roller is a little bit of clowning a little bit of joy a little bit of sass a little bit of anger and Mm. showing some of those frustrations Mm. i think that's why we go so nuts for the occasional really free female performer because it's just you don't get to do it in real life very much i mean ideally we do and that's the journey isn't it but yeah not there yet not but, there it, yet. but it is so primal watching a really yeah. awesome performer of any kind male female whatever but i i sort of i think you're right when you see women do it it's liberating and we all wish we could have yeah. we all like i feel like because i'm i'm 50 now ella and i i see it in my daughter she's 13 and i'm like babe i want you to be unapologetically you at every turn it's too late for me like i'm you know i'm not going to be the rock chick i'm going to be i don't know cool mum, whatever i'm entrepreneur whatever you want to call me i'm not putting you myself are down a rock star, though. yeah oh, but like, it's very in cool. your own field <laughs> Exactly. But, I, but I just think, you know, we see women do it and like, oh, I want a piece of that in me. And, and so that's the role you play as role models. It's very important. And that's quite addictive to share that because when I twigged to that, when I realised how freeing that was for others at a ripe old young age, <laughs> I realised there was something so powerful and that was like probably the secret source in Killing Heidi, why people sort of momentarily lost their shit for that project was because it was so wild and raw and unapologetic from a really young woman or or at least with her face attached and and yeah we rarely rarely see that so I think that's partly why it got such a big response and and I did that without even thinking so then when the thinking comes in years later it's much trickier oh (laughs) no thinking ruins everything (laughs) <laughs> Second guessing, you're good at that. <laughs> no, no. You want to be in the moment and in your heart and in your body. That's the joy of it, isn't it? Do yeah. you find, though, uh-huh. it's hard to switch that off in normal life? Um, No, not really. Because or do I you need to? Maybe don't switch it off. Sometimes I have to call on that that woman, that character, like that stage persona or whatever the right psychological, you know, psychobabble term is. Sometimes I need to dial her up for a meeting I'm having where I'm not as confident or a situation where I could use a bit of her unapologeticness and strength and brashness or whatever because in my normal life no that's not exactly who walks around all day you know having the interactions and running the show but I I do think it's really handy to have like you know it's Sasha Fierce Beyonce has Sasha Fierce and I have that sort of leopard print stage version of myself that can bring you know, bring in that energy and hold that space and be more confident or whatever. But it's the music. When I'm playing music, I find it very, very easy to switch into that mode. In fact, it's it's not a choice. The music turns that on in me. Mm. Um, and that is, I think, such a, such a wonderful part of being a musician is that you get to inhabit that so frequently when you're touring or gigging or writing. The latest single, um, Achilles Heel, is beautiful, I've got to say. And it's, but this is the opposite almost in terms of how, well, what we've been talking about, that sort of, you know, really full on out there rock chick persona. It's actually, 
you know, it's it's a very gentle, incredibly raw side of you that I think we haven't seen yet. And that's also, I imagine, quite difficult to tap into. But once you do, is it really freeing to be really honest in the way that you have been with this song? Yeah, this is, I think this is the, the 2.0, the adult version of what is then scary, uh, you know, like not that that teenage brashness and all that kind of punk and energy. This is the adult version of what's really intense for adults is sharing their true feelings, navigating relationships and and themselves, like, like whether you're doing right by yourself or letting yourself down, you know, it becomes this really, it's about, this whole new record is sort of about that internal work and that growth that you push for and sometimes you learn it through relationships or loss of relationships and the space that opens up after a breakup so you know that is just in that's an incredible time and again as a songwriter I sort of choose to use those those incidents and the space that they create to delve deeper and find the healing in that and find the stories in that but yeah I'm I'm so loving you know, capturing the the softer, more thoughtful sides of myself, which have always been there, but not as often made it to stage. And it's hard for me to trust that people are going to be as engaged and as entertained by my softer stories. But on the other hand, of course they are, because that's the whole other yin to the yang, you know, and we all have that. Yeah. Well, it helps you feel seen when you hear an artist or a writer say reflect your own experience in life and even if it's the opposite to you it allows you to reflect on your own experience in life and Stacey on uh, Facebook was saying there's nothing more freeing than being at a live gig and letting go but equally I reckon and I would love to know what it feels like from your perspective when you're in a gig and someone's seeing something so you know that raw beautiful gentle song and there's that silence yeah. in the space and I'm feeling goosebumps just thinking about it. what is it like for you up there knowing you created that well, I haven't done it yet, so that's going to be all happening very soon on tour. And I'm, you know, I think I'm, I'm probably going to cry. Like honestly, this new stuff is so emotional and so personal. And yeah. I mean, I've had a really, a very ridiculously life-changing year with the death of both of my parents earlier this year, and and some huge life changes post COVID, and including the COVID period my heart's just been sort of blown apart into a million pieces. So there'll be tears and they will be mine and they'll hopefully be the crowds as well. And I know I sound a bit flippant about that, but that is when you know you've done your job right. When when there is that silence and there is maybe some people having a sniffle, part of me will be super emotional and trying to hold it together, but part of me will be like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> well done, tick! <laughs> I mean, you know, artists, uh, you're a ringleader as well. It's an important part of what you do. I'm obsessed with the fact that you travel by train. Oh, yes. I love that. I really do. I'm a, I'm, I once travelled, I had an eight-hour train trip through, name drop, um, Europe from um, uh, Austria to uh, Germany, and it was the greatest eight hours of my life, Aww. just looking out a window. Magic. Do you, is it magic, magic for you? Why do you choose train travel? Well, A, I can't drive. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I've got my L's. I, I got my L's quite recently, so I'm still working on that. But I think because when the band kicked off and I got so busy as a young person, it was right around that learning to drive age. And yeah. I also didn't want to be the designated driver, if you know what I mean. Like I wasn't. Oh, sure. <laughs> I wasn't going to be uh, behind the wheel for a few years there. And, and I think on the train, there's something about motion, and a lot of creatives say this for writing, there's the motion you're not having to do anything and I just get so turned on by the scenery and the the rhythm and that's kind of where I do a lot of my best work is on the train it's just always worked for me I guess growing up so far from the city two and a half hours on that train from Violet Town to Melbourne my whole life to do all the things that I wanted to do but those periods of calm it's a real threshold and you arrive wherever you're going. You arrive excited in the city to, and to see what's going to happen and you're not stressed and you haven't been looking for a park. You're just ready to go. Yeah. And going and in the inverse, going back to the country, I have time to cool down. I have time to let the media jobs go and the, or the gig that went well or not well go. And I arrive back in the country so calm and ready to absorb that. So I think it's a real unsung 
um, another form of therapy is just giving you time to go through these thresholds slowly and gently. It's really good for mental health, I think. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. And you get a cup of tea in a styrofoam cup with a little biscuit yes. and there's nothing quite like it or a glass of wine in a plastic cup totally. on the way home. That's well, great. in you Europe. Dangerously hot, dangerously hot cup of tea that's like, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> That's true. I had French champagne yeah. on that and and I was travelling oh, no by myself. Was oh, well, I was travelling <laughs> by myself for the first time in my life. So I had no family. I had no one saying, do what we want to do. I was like, nah. I'm doing only what I, I want to do. Well, I, think your, I think your train experience is a little bit different than our V-line experience. Miff, and I think <laughs> you're, having, you're having the, the very nice high-class version of... <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but I, I love V-Line as well. I think, you know, train travel in Australia is pretty fun. Um, I had one last question for you, uh, actually, Ella, because over the weekend I watched Elvis, the movie. I and haven't seen it yet. It's I don't so know why I haven't great. seen it. Have you seen it? No. Oh, it's great. It's great. But that's not my question. I also watched the Foo Fighters tribute concert to Taylor Hawkins on the oh. weekend, right? Oh, so sad. So sad. Mm. But it got me thinking... Is rock and roll a very unhealthy career? Like, is it just a damaging life? Because it feels like people struggle to process what it means to be a rock star. And I worry for you. Technically, yes. The stats are in and they're not good. They're not good at all. Um, professional musicians or rock and rollers have a much shorter life expectancy. They're much more prone to depression and anxiety and severe mental health conditions and physical physical conditions too. It's not traditionally ever been a healthy lifestyle, but we are trying to change that. Um, there are some amazing organizations like Support Act, and it is Australian Oz Music T-shirt day coming up soon, which is a great way how you can support Support Act, who supports musicians and the behind the scenes people, crew especially, um, technicians. They live some of the hardest lives and it can be a lonely life. It's physically grueling. It's, yeah, look, it, it is no walk in the park and it, we, we hype it up because it's fun. Yes, the bit you see is fun. The bit you don't see, and Myth knows like all too well, like there is just a lot of not fun around the glam and the fun. And I think it would be, it's really great to talk about that because sometimes you don't, you don't get a lot of sympathy if you're a good looking man or a woman and you have this fun job called Rockstar doesn't mean that you're not having a shit time behind the scenes. So we should just be aware of that. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well said, I think, Ella. And I, I think add to that too the sexism mm. that has been recently uncovered in terms of the, that that huge report that was done um, into not just, uh, you know, performers' experiences but within the industry itself in terms of the record companies. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a lot of issues with it and... and yeah, Support Act is a, is a wonderful organis organisation that are doing great things. Um, but now I think we're starting to realise there's a lot of other things that really need to be done from the ground up. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of a lot of yeah. structures need to be totally torn down. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But I, 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 you absolutely. know, I feel like I'd like to acknowledge that the industry is so precious to us and going mm. back to what we said right at the top of this conversation. Gives about us life. Gives us life and I have deep gratitude to every player in the industry on, on stage and off because we would be lost without it. So thanks, Ella. Thanks, guys. So I should just mention you are touring in October and the album is there as well. So make sure you get yourself around it because it's beautiful and uh, go and see Ella wherever you can. She's gone already. She's, gone. She's off love to you, catch Ella. a train. We love you, Ella. She's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Well, Dr. Katrina Warren is going to be joining us in just a minute, but before she hops on the screen to us, um, we I just wanted to mention this one little photo that I saw this week, which just made my heart melt, Miff. It was Roger Federer oh. at his farewell with uh, Rafael Nadal sitting right next to him. There they are. And obviously it's very emotional. And look at them holding, holding hands. hands. I know. It's really, it's really sweet. It's really sweet to see that camaraderie and also, you know, that, that sense of family in such a 
such a huge industry that is tennis that yeah. they've found that and yeah. just that support. I love it. It's, it's just, a beautiful image. It's just two mates hanging out going, You're, yeah. you, you need a bit of support right now. Let me yeah. hold your hand. And yeah. I just want to see more of that because it's just gorgeous. So I think uh, it is time to welcome because um, we love our doggos and our pussycats here at Broad Radio. And I'm very thrilled to welcome one of Australia's favourite vets, Dr. Katrina Warren with Chili. Hi there. Mm-hmm. Hi, hi, Chili. Say hi. Hi, Chili. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Katrina. You've been upstaged. I'm sure that you're used to that. Always. When I had Toby all those years ago, people would stop and talk to the dog and completely ignore me. So I'm used to it. Well, I have a Labrador Daisy who sits at our front gate when we're not there and the whole neighbourhood walks, it's a lot of foot traffic. Everybody knows Daisy because she presses herself up against the, oh. the gate hoping to get a little pat through <laughs> through oh. the bars of the gate. <laughs> and when I'm out walking her, everyone's like, is this Daisy? And I'm like, yes, it's Daisy. She Dogs become celebrities. Oh, they sure do. And it's funny, we always know the names of the dogs but not the people that you're talking to. <laughs> But that's what I love at the dog park, and I know we, we, we're going to talk about dog parks a little bit later on, but um, at the dog park it's like I don't know any adults' names no. or, or humans' names. I know all the dogs and I know all the dogs' issues and health issues and, and needs, uh, yet nothing to do with it. And it's so nice. It's not about us yep. when you meet up with other dog owners, and it's gorgeous. And, and we know that. We know that owning a dog is a great way uh, for people to connect with other people. It's a great way to get you out of the house and exercising. So there is that social component uh, to dog owners. But, yes, we can talk about uh, dog parks. Well, let's dive in. Like. Yeah, let's let's dive Straight into in. dog parks, right, because I'm not a fan, mm. largely because I find the owners to be crazy and annoying. <laughs> Uh, That's me. (laughs) I'm sure I'm crazy and annoying too, but I think sometimes dog owners are very, I don't know, aggressive or a little bit judgy. So I don't like being there. What's your beef with dog with dog parks? They can do a lot of damage to dogs. So you're putting a group of dogs together of all shapes and sizes. This is a busy dog park. Um, All shapes and sizes and no one's assessing the temperament of any of the dogs and you let them run together. And most people don't have an understanding of dog body language. Most people think dogs have to run together to socialise. But there are so many fights in dog parks. And I know of, gosh, at least I know of probably a dozen dogs that have been really badly injured or killed um, just this year in dog parks. Mm, that's terrible and, to think. Yeah. How traumatic. Yeah, and, well, the, the other problem is that people get a puppy and they want to socialise it, so they want to have a happy social uh, puppy, and they think that that's what you need to do. But socialising is actually about exposing your dog to as many sights and sounds as smells in a positive way. Mm. You want them to have a positive experience so that they have the coping skills throughout their life. If you place a little puppy in a dog park, and a big bouncy Labrador comes over and crash tackles it, you can do lifelong damage to that puppy. You can make it fearful that they get injured. Um, you can do so much damage. So you're much better off spending one-on-one time training your puppy and only interacting with dogs that you know and trust. Yeah. You couldn't pay me. To, you could not pay me to let Chill run around with a group of dogs oh. I don't know. See, I, I think too... It, we, I, I just can't stand how owners think, because I don't know why, Daisy is desexed, but she's constantly got some giant thing on her back trying to hump her. And I'm like, can you just get your dog off my dog? And they're like, oh, no, they're just playing. I'm like, no. No, get no. off my dog. <laughs> it's not okay. But well, people don't seem to see that they're responsible for their dog's behaviour. No, there seems to be this new weird entitlement or something that's come along. I don't know if it's because of the explosion of uh, dog owners since COVID. There's a lot of first-time dog owners, but no one has dog park etiquette, so you shouldn't let your dog harass another dog. But the other the other thing that happens to me every day, I'll be walking chill on the leash on a street, and people let their dogs just run over and jump in his face. Now he is bomb-proof. He has, you know, he's great. But if he was a reactive dog, mm. that dog's going to get its face bitten off. Yeah. So. And it causes problems. And for people that have a reactive dog that are trying to avoid dogs, it's really, really stressful. Mm. So I don't know yeah, I don't know what is going on with that, but people just think their dogs can just do whatever they want. And, also, like and also just letting dogs off leads on, on roads. Oh, my I'm, God. I just I, I cannot... I, I cannot fathom it and mm. it sounds really yeah. sort of like I'm t- tutting them but it's it seems so unsafe to me and yet people do it all the time. I know and I feel like I'm tut-tutting all the time because my other big hate is the popularity of those 
retractable dog leads, you know, the extendable ones, because people don't have, they don't teach your dog good manners. Most people don't have control of their dog. They let their dog run. And I've seen a dog get hit by a car because it's just run up on the extension. Mm. And in fact, um, a, a, a lady I know has a, she had a quite a big dog and she got a retractable lead the other day. The dog chased a cat, launched onto the thing. She ended up flat on her face. She got taken off in an ambulance <gasps> because because it moved so quickly and the dog was so strong and she's whacked all down the side of the oh, head. Dear. They were worried she had a brain injury. Mm. See, so, so that's my banging on. Do we want to talk about? No, no, this? I love it. So, so my I have theories about dog owners. Right, we all think our dog is the best dog, of right? course. Well, and mine and is. what's funny? Yeah, I know that's funny because mine is. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> we all think our dog is the best dog, and we all think we're the best owners. And so it kind of becomes a bit like you get so feel judged by others. And you end up judging judging others. But what is what in your opinion? What is really good dog ownership? Because okay, you well, know you don't get given a license, you know. Well, you don't, and unfortunately, well, same with children, really, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> a really good dog ownership is researching where you get your dog in the first place. So not buying your dog online, so you're not supporting puppy farmers, because that has been a really big problem. And I'm just loving you've called me Stray's favourite vet there. Thank you. Yeah. That's very that's- <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. I don't know about that, but thank you. Um, so, so researching your dog's breed, researching where you're getting your dog—that would be my first thing. And making sure I say to people, if you don't know, if you can't go and see where your puppy is born and the environment that your puppy is born in, think really hard about getting that puppy. So, you want to know that that, that the breeder is responsible. Then, I guess you can only do your best but going to your puppy um, puppy preschool doing your proper socializing and then following up with your basic training because that seems to have fallen off these days as well people go to puppy classes for three weeks and then a lot of people don't follow up with their training um, that would be my tip socializing as much as possible and then obviously if you're out in public put your dog on the lead and pick up their poo because there seems to be a poodemic as well. Oh my God, oh. is there not? I cannot even believe the amount of poo in our street. Yeah. But I blame and the dogs that aren't on the lead because the owner's on their phone and they haven't correct. seen yes. that the dog down the road has done a big old turn. Correct. Have you become that person that says, excuse me? Oh Your yes. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> I've chased people. Have you? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Because I'm love, irate right about this. it. Yeah, no, it's fair <laughs> enough. It's disgusting. It's, it's like so up. disgusting. And yeah. I think the thing is, people think too, if your dog does it in the dark and nobody sees you, don't pick it up. Oh, so they walk out and they'll be like, great Dane sized poo on your doorstep. And you're like, mm. why aren't you picking it up? So that seems to have got worse. But I think we've also had something like a 20% increase in dog ownership. So it probably is the reason why, but it's disgusting. Mm. Is there an issue with the COVID dogs? We're reading that, you know, there was so many, there was that huge demand for dogs and now are we seeing so many more in our pet shelters? Yes, we are. Oh. And they're calling, it, they're calling it, is it pet regret? I think yeah. people, because what is interesting, because last school holidays, the June ones, I must have had it one day, I had five different friends or acquaintances all messaging me desperate to find somewhere, someone to look after their dog in the school holidays. What's happened is people are now going, oh, actually it is a really big responsibility and now we want to go away. Now we can travel. What are we going to do with the dog? And unfortunately, we've got a lot of dogs that are adolescents or teenagers, dogs, and so they've got behaviour. Um, some of them are just natural teenage behaviour traits, like you know, getting excited and chewing and digging. Others are becoming problematic. And so people are just saying, I, I can't handle the dog. It's really mm-hmm. sad. And well, a lot of dogs are separate separation issues which we all predicted because they were just all the cavoodles that were carried around for two years <laughs> like years. babies yeah well yeah, I've got and a, now I've, they don't cope on their own it's i've got sad. a covid puppy and she can she um, she's getting older now she's two and a half but she's quite um she gets quite destructive when i, I left her at home for the first time and and I know, I know Katrina you're probably going to say this is terrible but now I sometimes just leave something out that I know that she she can destroy oh, is that teaching her bad habits mind. or am I just going I'm saving the couch being chewed up by leaving out a letter that's on the bench that I know that she'll be able to chew and feel like she's done well, something as long as it's safe so I would say try and get some safe chew toys that she's comfortable with and put treats in them. Mm. What, what sort of dog did you say she was? 
She's a foxhound beagle. <laughs> she's, oh, she, she, she she's will a lot. Choose. She's yeah. a lot. So, so the Kong toys, you know, the hard rubber toys, and I always say you make sure you watch them for a while before you leave them on their own to chew anything because you don't want to choke or anything. But I would get some safe toys. Get her very used to every time you, maybe if you're going to have a shower or you're going into another room, give her the chews toys. Get her set up so she's used to the safe toys and redirect her onto that every time. Yeah. So every time you're allowed to give her something she's allowed to do instead mm. of household items. Yes, <laughs> yes, I know, I know. I knew that was going to be a bad question. Look, <laughs> I, I mean... But it's not because what you're really, what you're doing, as long as it's not dangerous, what you're doing is the same as what I'm saying. Give them something they're allowed to chew. It's just you don't really want to be giving her those things. So give her, start teaching her to chew on some safe chew toys. Yeah. Okay. I will say because uh, Labrador, she just ate everything. Mm. Um, yeah. She's now three and a half and is a lot better. But the Kong toys are amazing because they, she, you know, I always laugh when you read um, on the label of a toy um, for for big dogs, and I go, <laughs> she would destroy that in twenty minutes. But the Kong, those hard rubber, is like, thank God yeah. for them. That why do they? Sorry, go yeah. on. Okay, so you need to with the Kongs. You've got to make sure you get the right. Um, size toy so it's mm. always go a little bit bigger because you don't want it to be a choking hazard and then they do have the extreme rubber which is the black one mm. um which is harder for them to chew so you've got to before you leave your dog alone with them you've got to be really comfortable that they're not strong enough to chew through anything but yeah. a tip with those and and some of these toys too is you can stuff them with food and i used to do this with my golden retriever because he used to chew things he got used to get anxious I'd have a couple in the freezer every night, so you stuff some food, wet food in it, and because it's in the freezer, it takes them even longer to chew through the food. It's a bit like a big icy pole for them, yes. um, and that gives you a little bit more chew time. That's a good tip. That's a great um, tip. Daisy loves uh, the hard rubber toys that are like bones, effectively, but mm. they all look like dildos, really. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've got like... We've got... No wonder everyone knows Daisy at the front gate. <laughs> That's that house. <laughs> it's so funny you say that because I've got like just here. I've got the um, Where is it? I've got this front one. Look at this. This is their safety. That one right there. That's, just <gasps> That's the one she's got. That's what she's got. Yeah, oh, I see. Why? Why do they all? And she's got like three or four of her favourites. And sometimes they're just scattered around and we just look like we've had a big old orgy and not cleaned up after ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take that one to the park, but that was created by someone who's well, I believe. And I do work. I just to be clear too. I do often work with Cop, um, but I do love their toys. Um, but he's run off with it now. But that was created by someone whose dog choked on a stick. I think he choked on a stick and died. So he created this rubber toy that then Kong bought. But yeah, it looks very sus. <laughs> it does. Um, so I thought about that. It's amazing. We, we've got some um, specific do. questions for you. Um, one of our listeners, Nicole, is saying, how can we stop our 13 and a half year old dog licking the windows? Ooh. Should I spray chilli water? Um, oh, look, that, that can be difficult. You, you've got to wonder why, as long as she's had a proper vet check as well, to just find out if there's a reason why she's licking all the time, whether she just likes the taste. You could try spraying with something like that or put some lemon juice or citrus or whatever, your best is distracting and giving her something to do. So call her to you, give her, go back to one of these chew toys or a safe toy, just redirect the behaviour and reward her for doing something else. Because often people just let them get away with it and then they go back and do it again. Yeah. Um, but it's just as long as there's not a medical thing going on, an underlying reason, mm. she's trying to lick it for some reason. Is yeah. 13 too old to train a just dog not to do that? that. <laughs> no, no, it's not because it's old enough. They can also start getting a habit. It depends how long she's been doing it for. Yeah. It's been yeah. a new window. Um, yeah, there are some deterrents that you can get, but again, I'd get to the bottom of it and just try giving her an alternative. So it's more about the psychology behind it and, and trying to understand it from your dog's perspective, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and often people often complain because their dogs lick them all the time mm. and sometimes it's because they, you know, they like the salt or the taste. Um, it will become a habit. It can be, um, you know, calming for them. And then it's just, again, you say constantly, every time, redirect, redirect onto something. But it needs to be something that they want to do. Um, you've got an issue with your cat. Oh, yes, I do. And I'm, I look, he's, he's now probably 13 years old, I'd say. His name's yeah. Steve. Um, <laughs> he, he has had a lifetime of 
pooing on rugs, basically. I have to live in houses that have floorboards and if ever there's a rug or any kind of carpet, he will oh, poo on it. Steve loves a rug. He loves he loves a soft <laughs> surface. And I've, I've got two litters out for him and he still will poo on a rug if he has the okay. option. Okay, will he always poo on the rug if the rug is there? And if there's no rug, he'll poo in the litter box? If, uh, look, if there's no rug, I think he's always found somewhere else to poo on the couch or something. <laughs> he's just so like, I have to put a rug he's on got the a couch. furnishings fetish. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So, so where is he currently pooing? It, well, he, he also has access to outdoors as well. So he's indoors, outdoors. He has two litters. Right. He has rugs for his choosing. Does he, <laughs> does he use the litter tray though? Occasionally he does, but he doesn't enjoy it. I think he's terrified of it. I don't know why. Yeah, so sometimes, so it, normally if it's a change in, this is the, this is the routine for the, the litter box issues. If it's a sudden change in behaviour, we always say get your vet to give them a check-up in case there's an underlying issue. But it sounds like he's okay, it's been going on. Then there's usually an issue, particularly if they're an outdoor cat, it's usually an issue with the litter box, either the, the type of the tray, the type of the litter, the location of the box, because they like privacy to do their stuff. Mm -hmm. But they also like softness, because outside they dig in dirt. It's nice yeah. and soft. Okay, so, so maybe I change the litter. Yes, I would change the litter. And even short term, you could try, um, I mean, it's not something you do longer, but you could also bring some of the soil in as well, just for that soft to get him digging in a litter tray. Make sure it's, it's not a hooded tray, is it? No, no. Like sometimes cats don't like the hooded trays because they like to be able to do their business and get out, but some cats are okay. Um, <laughs> but I would, look, I would get a big tray. And put it somewhere yeah. nice. Is it private? Has he got privacy? They've got privacy, yeah. Mm. It, but what's well, maybe what's maybe he doesn't because he's already got the recycled paper. But, I thought that was the but, softest but, one. But, no, but, no, or, also, no, he. he also, he's sharing a litter tray yeah. with Merv, and Merv. maybe he doesn't like mixing with Merv. Maybe that, well, they've got their what? They've got one each, so well. Right, yeah, but... that's, I would put one in a different location because they don't like to share. So the general rule on that is one tray per cat plus a spare, even. Yep. Um, mm. Yeah. Like, and, <laughs> take out of my rugs and my life <laughs> and you need to keep it absolutely clean they won't use oh, the yeah. tray that's dirty so yeah. as long as there's no other who or we smells in there mm. um, yeah but I would definitely change the tray well I know. I have one last question for you, Katrina, because I am a, really actually a cat person. Whilst we have Daisy, I have 18-year-old Maggie, who is the light of my life. In fact, when the uh, when Melbourne had our earthquake last year <laughs> and the house felt like it was falling down, the first thing I said, even though the whole family was home, including my child, the first thing I said was, where's Maggie? <laughs> Get the cat. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> but is it okay? She basically rules the house. Is that a bad thing to prioritise animals? No. I don't think so because the animals are so much nicer to us. Than <laughs> I have a 15 year old daughter, and my dog is much friendlier and nicer to me in the mornings, let me tell you. So I think, I oh know, I think they deserve it. Yeah, they do. Well, thank you so much, Katrina. You really have. I'm hoping that you master Steve's situation. Your house is going to be made of kitty softer, trays. Softer litter and, and 17 litter boxes and, and no rugs. That's great. And we can catch more of your advice on Nine Honey. On, excuse me, Nine Honey, the website there. So um, uh, check that out. Katrina, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Good luck with the animals. Thank, thank you, you, Katrina. My workout routine comes with me wherever I go, and so does Bondi Protein. It gives me the post-workout nutrients I need. Fuel your body with Australian-made Bondi Protein. Broad Radio. Talking inspo we love, info we need, and sharing more of us. Watch and listen live every Tuesday, 9am, Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time at broadradio.com.au or find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and LinkedIn at Broad Radio Oz. Talk to us live. Call on 1300 8 Broad. Catch up on demand anytime, anywhere. Every time, everywhere. On the train, we'll be here. 2am existential crisis? <laughs> We've got you covered. Broad Radio. Here for more. A couple of more things to mention, Miff, that I'm loving this week. Heartbreak High. Oh, I binged it in a. 
I reckon, two days. It's so good. The new Australian reboot of a classic Australian drama from the 90s. Mm. And I, it's just an absolute joy to watch. And it's not, I'm not the target audience. No. I'm not a teenager. <laughs> I'm not a you know I'm not I'm not a young thing but my goodness it's been put together by such a, a wonderful creative team I think Marie Cardi's one of the yes. writers there's a whole bunch of other fabulous creatives behind this show it's a Netflix production so I think they've got a huger budget than mm. they ever would have if it was in terms of especially true. the music that they get to play on the show is extraordinary but it's just a wonderfully put together drama and I'm, oh, look I'm so happy for them it's the most watched television show on Netflix in Australia this mm. week but also globally Top 10 yeah. most viewed television shows on Netflix and beautiful diversity in its writing and its characters. Yeah. and Yeah, just so, so happy for yeah. that team that's put that together. And also bringing the term rack off into the <laughs> vernacular. I was a little disappointed because like the first episode, and I realised too, I found out that in the 90s, the reason why they used rack off in that series, oh, rack off, Darren, Yeah, love it, rack off. Um, was because they obviously couldn't say the F word oh. on Australian television at that time of the day. So they okay. had to come up with a word that had that same sort of onomatopoeic feeling, you know, mm. like, oh, what is it? And so it was rack off. But anyway, I was like, first episode, no rack off. Episode three or four, I think, is actually called rack off. <laughs> <laughs> That's gorgeous. I love it. There was one line, I can't remember who said it, but I didn't come in on the last dick. I didn't write in on the last Didn't write in on the last dick. <laughs> oh, the characters are just... <laughs> Beautifully drawn, and there's some fabulous one-liners. And, oh, it's uh, brilliant. It's, it's absolutely magnificent. But you talk about diversity. It's just a celebration of difference, but not in a way that the narrative is actually, oh, I'm different. It's The difference is normal, mm. and yep. it's it's perfect. And yeah. and I think the, the confidence of the characters is is just a joy to behold, and the way that they've been written, it's it, it, it's just really taken it up a notch from what we knew of of heartbreak high in the 90s as it's such a it's such a different playing field now and what a world. joy to be taking that to the world i know i and love that Australian oh, and yeah i'm just so proud so of great. everybody involved it's awesome i'm uh, talking of reboots of course we've got uh specs and specs yes, back it's back We're, how's that feel to be returning to oh, it's been unreal it's it's again just a joy to do it's not mm. it's not a difficult job to have because it's just fun uh, <laughs> we get to <laughs> sit around and, and talk with beautiful creative people and have a laugh and I think that's why we, we, we went, you came back and did it again why not you don't get TV jobs like that very often but also we get to showcase a lot of up and coming musicians and comedians that wouldn't normally get a go on Australian television because we're sort of older and trusted I guess mm. that's I guess my, more my role these days yeah. is to be able to help those up and coming to get a Guernsey as well and have a big audience too yes. because there's not many opportunities in this country to get a big audience when you're up and coming. And does it feel strange to, we've got a photo of you of like original, look how baby <laughs> you were. <laughs> look at the little, the little miff. Little miff. <laughs> does it, do you feel like a different person? Uh, yes, absolutely. Mm. I, I think I, I've always felt like a different person in every stage of my life. You know, you're always growing and evolving and, and that never stops. I don't think you hit a point where you go, that's it, that's me, I'm done, mm -hmm. I'm plateauing now because it's always up and down. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, that was a, a very different time. And, uh, look, it was such a fun time, though, my goodness. Yeah. If I could be having that kind of fun I again, know. I'd be still doing it. But, you know, it's life's different now. But I, it's I've been very lucky to mm. be able to have those great moments. Yeah. And your book is out tomorrow. tomorrow. Time of my life. <laughs> myth. Yeah, I know. I'm really nervous. Um, I've never <laughs> done this before. You know, it's, it's hard to have a first at this age, mm. I think. But this is it. And I just hope people read it and enjoy it and maybe take, you know, it's like songwriting, I guess. They, people, once you put it out there, people will take from it what they want mm. and relate to it in a way that they, they Oh, your need job's to. done. You've got to let it go. I know. You've birthed it. Yep. And it's now got its own life. That's right. That's right. So um, fingers crossed, you know, people enjoy it. That's, that's yeah. all I ask. Oh, I really. can't wait to read it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, thanks, um, there's one last thing that I really must mention and something I'm really excited about, and that is a new podcast that at Broad Radio we are producing in collaboration with Morris Blackburn Lawyers. So the whole premise of the podcast series is that think about when you, any, of, any women's rights that we 
um, enjoy right now, in many of those cases, the freedoms that we have are because of lawyers who have worked really hard to change laws, mm. bring in legislation, to actually shift society in a lot of ways. And so in this podcast, we're going inside landmark cases and the laws that we sort of now take for granted. And we've got some fantastic lawyers from Morris Blackburn Lawyers who are joining us, who are really at the forefront of fighting for women's rights. And the first episode is out now. It is about protecting reproduction productive rights. And in this uh, particular episode, I interviewed clinical psychologist Dr. Susie Allenson and human rights lawyer from Morris Blackburn, Lizzie O'Shea. And together they fought for something that I kind of take for granted now, which is safe access zones around clinics that provide abortions. Mm. Because before this happened, and it was a 20 year long battle for those two women, before this happened, um, well, We're going to hear in a minute a a little bit from the interview, but actually it wasn't safe for women to access abortions. They could be approached by anyone in the street. Absolutely. Directly at the door of these these places. Oh, horrific. So um, I'm going to share with you an excerpt from this interview in which uh, Dr. Susie Allenson, who actually worked at a fertility control clinic in Melbourne, she tells the story of the turning point for her that actually started her 20-year-long battle to actually to create, to, to demand actually safe access zones mm. for women. And um, so she worked at this clinic in Melbourne and it was, uh, she starts the story in the year 2000 and I've asked her right about here what it was like working um, at the fertility control clinic. It was a really wonderful woman-centred clinic that had every surface un- uh, service Um, under one roof. So we had pathology lab, theatre, consulting rooms, all under one roof. And it was quite holistic. So yes, we provided abortion. We also provided the full range of contraception, pap tests, sexually transmitted infection testing and and treatment, and also referrals for for any psychosocial and, and health issues that women had. Uh, We had a team of um, pregnancy counsellors as well. So, and I came on board as a sessional clinical psychologist uh, who would see women where perhaps their circumstances were much more complex and their decision was not clear cut. And our our whole aim was to facilitate women making a decision that was right for them, whether that was to terminate a pregnancy or to continue. Uh, so I, I love the staff, love working with the, with the women there. Uh, it, it was a tremendous place inside the clinic. <laughs> but outside the clinic, uh, there were um, religious extremists with ghastly sort of posters and they would get in women's face and space uh, with a full litany of misinformation. So they'd be telling women that they were murderers. They'd be telling women that uh, their relationship wouldn't survive. They would get count. They would get cancer. Uh, they, we were called a slaughterhouse, um, and they would block women from actually coming in, and also walk beside them, often you know for up to a hundred meters. And staff would cop that as well. Uh, staff would. Um, cop quite a lot as well so uh, and of course that was distressing to women uh, there'd be you know the occasional woman who'd come in and she just shrugged it off that was nothing their right to protest uh, even though I didn't see it as protest at all it was really a shocking form of violence against women um, but the majority of women were deeply offended and upset some were coming in with children uh, with partners with mums with friends and uh, we, we received a lot of complaints about that. Can't you do something about this? You know, why, why are they allowed to, allowed to behave this way towards us out on a public street? And the impact was enormous for both your patients and the staff, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Staff tended, we all tended to be focused on the women coming into the clinic and Yes, we knew it affected us too. And certainly one of the hardest things was the anger that would come up inside and and the sense of helplessness that we couldn't do anything 
to protect our patients. Um, no one seemed to be concerned about this abuse of women out on the public street. Mm. It's hard to fathom that people didn't care, but uh, you have your you have your theories as to why that is. Oh well, I think we're a blatantly sexist society, <laughs> and and it's the work you know, the world has been made by white men for white men, um, and so a lot of people miss out there, but but particularly women. Uh, so. Yes, and Lizzie might say a bit more about that. Lizzie has a slightly more in-depth view than I do, having the mind that she does. What is, what is your view, Lizzie? Oh, well, I think also there was a bit of a gap legally about who should deal with this problem. I mean, people like Susie at the Fertility Control Clinic, they're really passionate about protecting their patients and they're very stoic at putting up with the abuse they experience themselves. But there was often this attitude that it was someone else's problem to deal with that you know for a long time the clinic talked to various authorities asking very politely uh, in a very um, conciliatory way if they could have assistance to deal with this problem uh, because you know after 2008 when abortion was decriminalized in Victoria this is a lawful health service and it's not clear why staff and patients should have to put up with this but there was a lot of deflection and nobody really wanted to deal with it so that's why I'm a big fan of Susie she decided that's something she's going to take on herself and uh, she was relentless which is really what you have to be in these circumstances I think. Well it's absolutely true you were relentless you fought for 25 very long years for safe access zones but there was an event that really was a turning point in 2001 um, that was both tragic and very much a line in the sand for you and everyone at FCC. Um, Susie, I know that it's difficult for you to talk about it, but can you please share what, what happened in 2001? Uh, well, we've just passed the 21st anniversary of the murder of our security guard, Steve Rogers. Uh, he was uh, shot dead in the clinic reception area by an anti-choice zealot. Um, and Steve was a 44-year-old dad and son, brother. You know, he had all these people who loved him. He hadn't been with us that long, but he, he certainly uh, carried out his duties in a, in a very calm way. He was a lovely fellow. Made me feel safe, that's for sure. So on that morning, a, a very derelict-looking guy came into the uh, clinic and uh, Steve was about to finish up his his time uh, on that day because the um, extremists, the usual extremists out the front usually left soon after 10. And uh, if it wasn't for Steve stepping in and also the par two partners of women at the clinic, then the gunman would have uh, killed everybody in the, in the clinic. He planned, he had all this equipment to uh, burn the clinic to the ground. So that, that was a, a very traumatic time and the clinic came together incredibly well. Uh, we really bonded and we already had an excellent bond and, and we just worked together well to get through that. What There were two things that really stand out for me and that is that firstly we went, right, that's enough. We have to go public demanding that we have safe access zones. This has just all gone far enough. And to be honest, I thought that this would be the final straw that would force the state government or Melbourne City Council to step in and protect us, protect our patients and protect staff. Well, I was pretty wrong about that. Um, the second thing that really stood out for me was that the day following the shooting, most of our patients turned up. You know, this is because the work that we do involves women facing a really urgent crisis that if you're unexpectedly pregnant or it's a problematic pregnancy, you need urgent care. And I still don't think our society has got their head around that at all. Uh, so, yep, that was the turning point, Jo. So that's the essence of the background of this particular story. It's incredible to think that happened in Melbourne. In Melbourne. And it's utterly chilling, utterly mm -hmm. chilling. And to think that it's taken a long time for change to happen and that for women to feel safe and secure and for, for them to feel safe and secure, it's just... I, I, I'd forgotten about that in Melbourne. Yeah. 
it, and it was horrific at the time and, and to hear it again, it's I mean, that, that undertone is still there within the community. It, oh, it absolutely is still there, but thankfully due to the 25 years of yes. the fighting from both Lizzie and Susie and also a big team, big team of um, people, men and women behind them who fought through High Court and, and um, Senator Fiona Patton actually was instrumental in that legislation coming for coming through That's as right. well. But it's a really interesting thing that we've kind of bookended the show, Miff, with um, whatever women can do to fight for bodily autonomy. We started with Iran and now... Uh, this particular fight for, um, you know, the rights and that's happening, of course, in America at the moment with Roe v. Wade. Exactly. It continues on, doesn't it? It sure does. And these extraordinary women and, and other folk who are also engaged in the cause, uh, you know, the word brave gets used way too often. It's overused, but my goodness, there's mm. a real bravery to this because you're putting yourself out there in a way that is at times dangerous. And yes, and I, you know, all power to them and, and huge gratitude to them too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, that is a beautiful uh, link to our second little bit that I'm going to share with you to take out the show. And that is exactly where we acknowledge the courage of um, people who put up their hand and say, actually, something has to be done. So I'll do it. So uh, this is an... an just to take us out from uh, this show um, and again you can catch it's called Lay Down the Law the podcast and you can catch that wherever you get your podcasts um, but uh, just to uh, wrap up the show um, to reflect exactly what you're saying there Miff and thank you so much for oh, joining us always a pleasure Joe. thanks for having me I love coming in oh you're just a delight to share the show with but I'm going to leave you with this particular excerpt from Lay Down the Law in which um, Susie and Lizzie acknowledge the courage of people who put up their hands and say, no, I'm going to do something about this. I do think like failure is the foundation of success here, though. We, you know, when I came on, we lost in the Supreme Court. It was a failure. The argument that we made wasn't accepted by the judge. Um, but we were prepared for that outcome. We planned to uh, explain it and then justify why we needed legislative reform and work with people like Fiona to introduce this legislation and from major parties who'd probably prefer not to do much about it if they can avoid it, uh, and then build up other um, uh, cap the capacity of the movement with other allies to continue this reform. So I think there's a lot of failure involved in activism, I have to say, but that, yes, that shouldn't is. be a signal <laughs> to stop. That, in fact, of course, before you succeed, you're going to have lots of um, disappointments and the more friends you've got, the more collaborative you are, the better you are able to sustain that and use that as a building block to take it to the next level and, and use it as a, as a chance to create change rather than to give up. And so I, I'm not um, trying to discount Susie's persistence by any stretch, but I do think we all need to think about how we can cultivate that persistence because that is the foundation of success. And we've all got it in us, I think, and the, and the stronger our movements are, the more diverse they are, the greater capacity we've got to continue to be persistent and to win social reforms that can seem really distant at the outset, but then when you get there, it feels like it was always going to happen. But, um, you know, that's the point, keeping keeping up your spirits, finding inspiration from others and keeping your eye on a long-term goal. Uh, and that those they're, they're along the way, those failures might seem like failures, but they can lead to success. So I'm going to finish then with a quote from you, Lizzie, because I think that the inspiration is very real and it's very important right now worldwide. But the other thing that I think is important to remember is this from you, Lizzie. It's not hard to think of famous men from big moments in history. We're accustomed to thinking of men as the heroes of stories. But every day in large and small ways, women are heroes. How does that feel hearing that, Susie? Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful. And and she's spot on. Really spot on. You know she was talking about you. Oh, oh, were you? I thought you were talking about women in general. Oh, yes. But... Part of our empowering. You're a pretty paradigm oh, example, you. though, Susie. <laughs> It's so, oh, it's so fun it? working on these campaigns. Honestly, women working together, it's a really enjoyable environment. Like I've worked in a lot of different activist campaigns and I've had the most fun and felt the most inspired when I've worked with other women. I mean, it's always got down times, don't get me wrong. There's always difficulties along the way, but it's just been so exciting in each of the campaigns that I've worked on for reproductive rights to see how women understand this implicitly, get what they're fighting against, can find allies along the way. And, you know, just with 
relentless enthusiasm, take advantage of opportunities and turn them into transformative social change. And so it's always a privilege to work with women on these kinds of movements and, and as a lawyer as well, obviously. Um, and yeah, Susie's the, the classic example of that and someone we can take inspiration from. Come on, come on, come on.